Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people right here in Western Australia. And today, I really want to get into what mindfulness is and how we can uh, use this to make positive actions to be all we can be. And today, my guest is Catherine Chules. Born in WA and having lived in a variety of towns from Wyndham to Vass to Kalgoorlie, Catherine is the founder of Mind and Movement that offers courses in mindfulness and meditation, as well as retreats. As well as offering public programs, her programs have been taken up by staff at UWA, ECU, Royal Perth Hospital and palliative care education programs. Catherine originally started her career as a lawyer, working in places like the Ombudsman Office and Disability Discrimination Solicitor. She's also travelled and volunteered in a variety of countries overseas. Lecturing at Deakin University in Victoria and has also been a researcher at Murdoch Uni before training at the University of Massachusetts Medical School to become an instructor of mindful, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Oh, bit of a mouthful, sorry. Yeah. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, so let's start with a question that I'm, I'm particularly keen about, which is, what is mindfulness? Yeah. What, what, what does it mean? Um, I've got friends whose minds are going 10 to the dozen and often I think they could do with a bit more mindlessness. Um, but mm. what, does, what mm. does mindfulness mean to you? Okay, so um, interesting because we probably have a slightly different understanding of it. So yeah. interesting to tease this out a bit. Yes. Um, and one of the ways that we can have a look at what mindfulness is is by looking at what mindlessness is. And I would say mindlessness are those times when we find ourselves driving home, thinking about what happened in the office. We've got no idea, did we stop at the stop sign, go yes. through the green light, how we got home, but we find we're at home somehow. We've been on automatic pilot the whole way. Our right. body has been present, but our minds have been somewhere else. Our minds have been caught up in thinking, usually thinking about the past or about the future or about you know, the next holiday, la yes. la land, something else. So mindfulness is actually having the mind and the body in the same place in the present moment here now. Mm. Um, and we can be mindful of our external environment and very importantly, we can be mindful of our internal environment as well. Right. Uh, often we go about life putting all of our energy into what's going on out there, yep. not aware of what's going on in here. And, you know, bubbling away in here are all sorts of things. There are impulses, there are judgments, there are reminiscences, there are emotions, there are loves and desires. And because all of our attention is outwards or caught up in a story, thoughts about something that happened in the past or the future, we actually aren't so present to what's going on in ourselves Right. to then be able to make choices about the, the different experiences that we have inside and actually move us into action without our knowledge. Right. Yeah. So is it, is it is it like a state or is it yeah. a focus, uh, a point of focus? So, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's a way of being. Yes. So it's a way of being present to what's happening here now for me in this in this moment. It's also a set of practices so we can develop it. And all of us have the capacity to be mindful. All of us at times are mindful. Mm. But all of us also... Um, spend a lot of our time not present. And, you know, there's interesting research that was done um, in the US with over 2,000 people where they randomly um, surveyed them using iPhones, asked them in that uh, research, firstly, where's your attention? Is your attention on what you're doing or is it somewhere else? Then ask them how happy are you from zero to 100 and ask them what activity that they were doing. And they were trying to see how often people, in fact, aren't present to what they were doing. And crunching thousands and thousands of bits of data, um, they found that almost 50% of the time people aren't attending to what it is that they're doing in the moment. Right. So mindlessness is a really normal part of being a human. Our minds are so interesting. They generate lots of lovely stories and then they can get caught in um, thought processes that aren't so fun as well. Yes. Uh, so, you know, the thinking mind is is wonderful and it's also mm, not so helpful at times. But we often take get taken away from this moment here now by that thinking mind. Right. And what's 
what are the benefits of being mindful or what are the pitfalls of not being mindful? Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe starting with some of the pitfalls of when we're not aware of what's happening externally and internally, we will be we will be triggered into behaviour through emotions, through thoughts that we're not even particularly conscious are happening and find ourselves reacting, find yes. ourselves caught in a negative spiral um, without any awareness of what's going on or any capacity to pause and say, hmm, is, is this really what's called for here? Is this how I want to be in the world? Is this uh, good for me, good for others? So that's not so helpful, that, yeah. that mindlessness, so that like, lack of awareness. So you're almost like at the, at the whim of these um, stories yeah. or thoughts or beliefs, labels yeah. that you've, you've got. Yeah. And it's, yeah, so you're responding, uh, reacting to Yeah, that. that's a really good way of putting it, being at the whim of it. And sometimes um, we talk about thoughts and emotions being good servants and not good masters. Right. And when we're not aware of the process of thinking, when we're not aware of the process of the emotions coming and going, we just are being pulled as if a puppet by those thoughts and emotions. Right. It's not also always so helpful. So in developing greater awareness through practicing mindfulness, we develop the capacity to relate to thoughts, to relate to emotions rather than from them. Right. If that makes sense. To sort of see them exactly. as they play out yeah. rather than being in them. Exactly. Move from being in the drama to being an observer, a witnesser. Right. Ah, anger's here. How interesting. Hmm, I can feel that. Yep, I can feel that urge to shout at that person. Yes. Is that really what's going to be the best thing to do right now? Or yes. can I sit with the discomfort of this anger mm. and choose a response that is more likely, in fact, to get an outcome which is an outcome I would like and might be an outcome that's better for that person as well. Yes. I think uh, you, you said something there about can I sit with my anger? Yeah. Um, that actually means sitting with something that's quite uncomfortable. Absolutely. And inherently we don't like yep. sitting with yep. things that are uncomfortable or painful. We, mm. we move away from them. Mm. So how do you sit with that? Yeah, yeah. A really vital part of mindfulness. Um, I run the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, as you mentioned, which is an intense program. Mm. People are asked to um, practice 45 to 60 minutes a day, about 30 hours of face-to-face -face contact. And in the first class I say to them, one of the things that we're going to be learning and practicing and exploring is sitting with discomfort. Now, I don't put that on my flyer. Yes, Oh, that's come and learn sound. how to sit with discomfort. Yeah, yeah. that's what I want more that's of. That's what's up and tolerant. Yeah. But when we think about it, um, when we think about the reality of human existence, which is that discomfort comes at us at all different ways. Um, if our only way of being with discomfort is aversion, get me out of here, blame, uh, denial, all of those reactive ways, um, we just stay in drama. Mm. Uh, and because human existence is characterised by discomfort as well as by joy. Um, you say characterised by... Di discomfort is part of life. Yeah. It's unavoidable. And if, if we don't have a way of relating to discomfort other than reacting, it's going to cause us a lot of suffering. If we can see discomfort, notice what happens, accept that discomfort is going to be part of oh, this moment allow it to come, allow it to go, without it pulling the strings of our mm. um, reactive biology, uh, if we're able to sit with it, not only are we going to experience less of the stress response, less of the reactivity, we're going to be a person who is useful um, in the storm. You know, you think about who you would like to be with when the shit's hitting the fan, pardon my French. Yeah. You don't want to be with the people who are running away from discomfort. Yeah. You want to be with the people who can say, oh, this is unpleasant. Yes. I can be here, peaceful, calm, feeling the stress. But resourceful as well. And not needing to run away from it. Yeah, yeah resourceful, good way of putting it. Yeah. Super, super. Um, 
I, I sometimes find that um, when when you do sit with discomfort, discomfort, uh, uncomfortable things, yeah. that often that just behind them, there's mm. some great learning mm. and almost releases a lot of energy mm. from that. So it's almost like mm. at times discomfort is almost like the packaging of, of something really great, but you have to get through that nasty packaging yeah. to get into it. Yeah. And, and what might lie behind it might not feel great, but needs attending to in some way, shape or form yes. and will stay there until we actually attend to it. Yes. Um, so, you know, we've all had lives where we've been hurt, we've developed capacities to get on and cope that have been about pushing stuff down. And so that's sitting there, pushed down. Um, and the, the, the discomfort and the capacity to be with discomfort enables us to release some of those things that are sitting there pulling our levers at times as well. Yes. Um, There's sort of great um, psychic energy. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. So um, there's obviously a, a big focus for you and then quite, you know, you're obviously passionate about it mm. and you turn it into bit. Where did your journey with mindfulness come from? Mm. And how have you got to this point yeah. where you've not only, it's not only your focus, but it's now your business yeah. as well. So yeah. can you tell us a bit about the journey to this yeah. point? The first time I um, meditated was my mum took me 27, something like that years ago, to the uh, meditation that was led by the Buddhist monks um, at the Armadale Community Health Service. I can't remember exactly where it was in my life's journey. At that time I was going through a relationship breakdown. Right. I don't know if it was in the middle of that or after that and she thought it would be good for me. Did she um, meditate herself? Well, I suspect that she only did for the purpose of taking me along. And right. Now and for, you know, ever since then pretty much, she said, oh, I can't meditate, I just fall asleep. <laughs> um, so she really got me into it. And initially, so for the first 10 or so years, um, I was a meditator who used it as a coping mechanism. So right. things are going a bit rocky, oh, I'll go back and do a bit more meditation. Yeah. Things are going fine, nah, don't need to. Oh, right. Um, so for the first 10 or so years, I was more off the cushion than on the cushion. What do you mean by off the cushion? Not that? doing it. Right. Yeah, so not meditating, um, yeah. very irregular. And then... As a reactive thing almost. Yeah, a, a, as a coping mechanism. Yes. And then I um, started doing it a little bit more consistently and could see the benefits of it in my life just in terms of you know the the ways I was able to engage with the things that previously um, would get me uh, riled up reactive unhappy yeah um, and mentally as well I was working in that time in in areas to do with social justice and have a really strong um, commitment to the world uh, being um, a fairer place and, and, and how can I be in that? And so, you know, this, the world's full of injustice, so how do I engage with the world and not get bent out of shape and still do play a part in that, in that work as well? Yeah. So I found it really helped me to be able to engage with that kind of work uh, and, the, and my reactivity um, more easily. So time went on. I just became bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, about 10 years ago or so, oh, no, about 13 years ago, did my first silent retreat and that was a wonderful experience. Is that the, the, going the deeper. 10 day? Uh, so that past. one was a seven day. There are a yeah. number of different ones um, around. So that's seven days, not talking to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Just meditating. Yeah. And and it's a teacher led process. So there yeah. is a teacher there and they give um, talks in the evening and they might lead some uh, meditations, but mostly it's you mm. doing sitting meditation, walking meditation, sitting meditation, walking meditation, mm. self guided. Not interacting with anybody else. No. Um, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's a fascinating process to be with your own mind for that period of time and have the laboratory of the self that that structure enables to be able to be there and observing 
the nuances of the mind, the desires that arise, the boredom, the irritation, the get me out of here, that, oh, this is wonderful, you know, just so you went all the of the full range. So you gambit of yeah, emotions in that. Yeah, And that's here in Western Australia. Um, so the first one I did was in Thailand, but I, I regularly go up to retreats in um, Serpentine. There's a major great meditation centre and uh, retreat centre run by the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, but they... Um, they run retreats there themselves and they enable other teachers to come and run retreats there as well. Yeah. So um, I sit uh, every year, seven or nine day silent retreats as part of my commitment to working in this space. Um, right. I, I think it's incumbent on us who are seeking to teach this to be really doing it, uh, doing the work ourselves as well. Yes. Yeah. So it's do as I do, not necessarily do as yeah. I say. Yeah, and it's and it's funny, you know. Just on that note, um, I don't have perfect mindfulness. I am so much a learner in this space, and sometimes I can feel, oh, you know, I should be so much more advanced in my practice to be teaching others, and then I have this. Uh, it might be just to reassure myself, you know, thinking about the maths teachers and the best maths teachers, they say, are the ones that don't get it initially, that actually find it difficult and have to struggle with the problems. Um, the, the people who immediately get the maths answers haven't understood what the students will be dealing with. So yes, they haven't been through the process exactly. of working it out. So I sort of see myself as, oh, I'm that terrible math student who becomes a good math teacher, teacher. I hope. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah. So you've been um, meditating for 10 years, yeah. using it as a coping mechanism yep. to the to the sort of work that you're doing with um, you know, social justice. As, and personal as issues lot. coming um, yeah. up and down. And then you've almost gone from yeah, doing it, what, sort of, some days, every day, most days, yeah. for a while, and then bang, seven days, yeah, flat out, yeah, and and then what happened after? That? I I probably almost had a daily practice before I did that, mm. um, and then pretty much since then it's been a daily practice and the commitment to doing at least annual retreats. I've done a, a month retreat in Nepal um, at a Tibetan monastery, which was a fascinating experience, um, and then in about. 2011, 2012, thought experiencing the benefits for myself, um, thought oh, a couple of things. How might I be able to use this? How might I be able to do more of it? And how might I be able to use it in my life more? Um, so that's when I thought, oh, I've been brought up with a good, strong Protestant work ethic. If I make it my work, then I'll permit, give myself permission to do more of it. Oh. Uh, so it was, it was a, oh, that's a good idea. So then I looked around at the different um, processes that existed for training people to become um, teachers in this area and found the University of Massachusetts uh, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Instructor Program. And the thing that... Um, I found reassuring about the, that because I had a little bit of a sceptical view on uh, the whole mindfulness business. Yes. Um, so uh, when I looked at their approach, they required people to have a daily practice. They required people to do yoga. They required people to have sat seven-day silent retreats. So I thought they're doing it from a place where I feel comfortable, yeah. um, from a place that's really grounded. So I thought, okay. And also... Um, because it was at a medical school of a university, they now had 35 years of research into their program. Everybody, right. tens of thousands of people, gone through their program, all pre and post tested. So, how did you test for mindfulness? Oh, so they tested lots of different things. Um, so that program, but I, I can come back to that question. Yep. I'm sort of answering it around okay. the corner. Okay. For sure. uh, their program started at the medical school initially for people who'd been through the medical system with chronic health conditions and the medical model now didn't have that much to offer. Incredibly stressful process. So they were looking for ways to support the people going through this health system who've now got to the end of what was able to be given to them. 
one of the directors of the medical school, a guy called John Kabat-Zinn, um, had been a long-term meditator and he saw it having a role for um, patients. And so he developed this program, told the other directors of the medical school, just send me your two hard basket cases. Initially, people coming in had you know 12 years of chronic condition, chronic pain, cancer, HIV, all sorts of things. Um, and so what the tests that they were doing initially, the pre and post tests, were around um, quality of life, stress, physical symptoms. So it was more about well-being mm-hmm. than measuring mindfulness. Right. But since then, because it's become um, something that is being very seriously researched now, a number of scales have developed. So it's that psychometric scales, um, yeah. you know, questionnaires do you find your mind wandering all the time do you you know so it's about the um, aspects of mindfulness and self-report measures and there's a whole heap of uh, critique of how we measure mindfulness as well in the literature Um, it's not a straightforward process no i can't imagine it being because it's quite a subjective experience yeah and interestingly if you've never paused and sat with your mind you might have a sense that you're very mindful and actually initially one of the things that happens when you pause and turn inwards and start paying attention to how this mind works you think oh wow it's all over the shop Mm. um so you might have higher confidence exactly higher confidence initially that the more you practice you do, the more you think, oh, wow, how about that? This human mind is, is, is amazing, crazy, all over the place. Mm. Yeah. Super. So you, how long was, you went and did the course. How yes. long was that for? So they have three um, face-to-face modules, uh, and I did all three of them in 2013. And then there's a process of accreditation, um, which takes a number of years. I so I did all of the training in 2013 and sent over my um, portfolio of information. So I have to um, video classes, I have to do essays, I have to do various things. Sent that all over in February this year and got the certification in July this year. Awesome. So, you know, four-year process for me. Yeah, so that's a big commitment. Yes. So yes. what did you go through in terms of... You know, obviously, you have this lawyer background, and mm. you know, often we think of lawyers charging in like seven minutes increments and mm. they get paid well, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So, you've got this, you know, solid, you know, almost career, mm. and then there's this other thing mm. um, that you, you want to do. How, what were the sort of stories you were telling yourself? How did you convince yourself to actually, or is this thing I want to do? Or oh, maybe not. Or oh, but then yeah. there's a house to pay for and yeah. or stuff like that. How did you manage that sort of transition and what what was going on there? Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me was projecting onto the world um, views about meditation, views about mindfulness as it being all woo woo. Hmm. Uh, so. I felt some insecurity around being perceived in that way. Uh, so that was something that played on my mind. How am I going? How are people going to think of me? You know, is this um, out of touch, out of reality kind of person? Um, no idea. So that was a concern to me, um, and and that was one of the reasons I chose to do the training at the University of Massachusetts, you know, their research base, I thought I could go back and talk to some of those cynical lawyers and say, oh, maybe you need to look at it a bit deeper. How, how about having a look at some of this research? Right, so um, giving it the point of legitimacy. Exactly, exactly. So that was that was part of the mm, not sure how what's going to happen, how, you know. Um, I'm lucky in the sense in many senses, but one of the senses that I'm lucky in is that I've never had a need to have lots of stuff. Um, I was brought up in a family where we were not at all encouraged to um, be acquisitive, 
get stuff, see ourselves in terms of what we had. Mm. And I feel that that is a real gift. So I buy my clothes from the op shop. I, you know, do things that I, I lived quite cheaply. So I knew that um, I was able to live in a way that doesn't require a lot of funding. Um, I can make choices around that that aren't difficult for me, that might be difficult for other people who have had a different sort of upbringing, a bit different sense of identity. I also um, was in a relationship, am in a relationship with a wonderful man who supported my choice. Um, he's not particularly interested in mindfulness, and but he sees the benefit uh, of it for me and for others. So he didn't dissuade me from it. He supported me doing it, and um, I... To do the training, I used some money that my grandfather had left me when he died. So, you know, there were a number of things that came together right. at that time that enabled me to do it. It would have been a much harder decision if I didn't have all of those factors present in my life. Um, I wouldn't have been able to make that choice, right. I don't think, if any one of them wasn't there. Yeah. And did you go and do the course in Massachusetts with the view of turning it into a business at yeah. some point? Or was it deep in – all right. Yeah. No, so I went thinking I, I'd like this to be my work. Yeah. Right. So uh, you've done the course mm -hmm. and then is that when you set up Mind of Movement? Uh, yeah, and I was working either full-time at that stage or part-time at the univers at Murdoch University doing research. Into? Um, education, so looking at... Uh, education, secondary education for kids in low socioeconomic areas and their transition through school, their engagement with school, their transitions out of school, what next. Um, so it was researching in that area. So from a social justice perspective, looking at how kids who are least well-resourced um, find that experience going through school, moving into the workforce or not moving into the workforce. Right. Um, and so that also enabled me to feel, okay, I could do part-time work as I moved into this new project. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, another important factor. Um, you and still I, need to pay bills, don't exactly, you? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I, actually I worked part-time and did the work with Mind and Movement up until the end of 2015. So 2016 and 2017, uh, the first two years that I've been full-time um, in the business. Right. Yeah. So when you originally set up the business, yep. um, so you've got this knowledge from your course that you've yep. done and your experience in the past. How did you go through the process of packaging it up? What am I going to offer? Mm. What, what benefit am I? To, how, how do you sell? Mm. Uh, how do you sell the state of mindfulness? Mm. 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 Even you asking <laughs> that question is making me squirm because <laughs> I, I, I um was it making you squirm? I have I have discomfort around the idea of of selling mindfulness and the uh, and recognizing the pressure in a um marketplace to describe a, a product, mindfulness, in a way that won't be complete, that won't tell the whole story because you're trying to sell something. So right. um, so that's my disquiet. And that's happening. That's yeah. happening. Um, people are making all sorts of claims about mindfulness yeah. based on research that has nothing to do with what they're actually selling. You know, the research into mindfulness on the whole comes from really – in the, the, the intense programs where people are doing 45 to 60 minutes practice a day over eight weeks, in those programs, yes, they are seeing changes to the brain. You know, parts of the brain are changing as a result of that. Fascinating stuff. But people then create an app and say, use my app and you'll get all of these results. 
Well, no, there's nothing to show that that app produces these results or come along and do this pro- this process, you know, breathe three times and you'll get all these results. But there's no research into what they're saying and where the research comes from. Right. If that makes sense. Yes. So people um, describe what they're doing as mindfulness and it may well be mindfulness, but it's not mindfulness of the depth that has in fact... Um, generated the, the beneficial results right yeah anyway so I'm, I'm aware that oh getting into into this as my business there's going to be all sorts of pressure to try and sell it in a way um that oh i might not be comfortable with so i started off just ran a little community program with a mate uh and we did that for a little while uh, I also, in 2014, ran the first mindfulness-based stress reduction program um, right. for myself. And so I feel really comfortable around that program because it does have... And that's what you learned in Massachusetts. Exactly. It does have so. 35 years of research into it. I felt comfortable using the um, description of the program that they use in University of Massachusetts. So I felt ethically comfortable in what I was saying about what I was doing. Um and I have, I have deliberately not chosen to um, go out looking for work in places where I think that it might have a tendency to encourage me to tell only one part of the story or start using mindfulness for a productivity benefit or something that I might not be comfortable for. I, Can you I, give me an example of that? Okay, so in the corporate sector. Right. So if, if a corporate um, a corporation comes to me and asks me to do something, fantastic, love to. Does that happen? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't want to be going in and trying to convince anybody that they should have mindfulness in their workplace mm. so that their employees will stop whinging about the conditions and start feeling responsibility for their own stress Um so that they'll be more productive, you know, all those things make me feel a little bit uncomfortable about how there would be a, a I would feel some pressure to start selling it in a particular way, um, which is not where my heart is. Right. Yeah. Where is your heart with this? So my heart in this is about people finding greater freedom from the ways that we are hardwired as organisms. Our biology keeps us reactive. We have a negativity bias. We have all sorts of ways that don't improve the quality of our life and get in the way of us flourishing, if you like, um, that, that mean that we make decisions and choices that are conditioned by our past. So what I'm interested in doing is supporting people to understand what it is to be a human being, being more self-aware, having greater capacity to um, respond to the triggers, the stressors, and make choices that are beneficial to them, beneficial to others. Um, and that can that can absolutely happen in a workplace, and I do it. I, I work in a number of workplaces, yeah. um, and I feel very comfortable that um, it's an appropriate thing to do. Mm. I just don't want to be going out selling mindfulness. That makes me uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. So it's a matter of offering it and then this yeah. is my signal. Yeah. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm putting it out there, and if it's what you want, yeah. you'll come to me. Yeah. So mindfulness, as you describe it, is almost like a, a – a state or an outcome, yep. so to speak. Um, so what are you actually doing in your courses? So earlier on you were saying how people are selling apps and how they link that to this this mindful yep. mindfulness state that has all the research behind it and, and what have you. And um, how what, what do you do in your sort of programs, the steps that you take mm-hmm. in order to achieve that yep. sort of state and experience it? Yeah. Um, just before I talk about that, I, I don't want to be saying that apps are not appropriate. I no. think apps are lovely things yes. and apps are really important to help um, people engage in it using the technology. 
I'm just concerned about um, claims being made for uh, particular products and ways of doing mindfulness that actually aren't research-based. Yes. So, so I guess what please, I'm saying to use, any listeners here... Yeah, use is, the app if it works. Use the apps, but do your research. Yeah. Consume wisely. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, so in, for example, in the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, there are a number of different um, components to it. We do guided mindfulness meditations, we do reflective processes, we look at um, a number of different uh, sort of themes um, such as uh, perception, conditioning, interpretation. So these dis- education and discussion. Yeah, and- education and discussion. Um, we look at uh, the ways that we look at the actual human stress response, we look at the negativity bias of the human mind um, we explore difficult communications we look at uh, moving from reactivity to response um, we include both formal mindfulness meditation which is a key way of learning and cultivating mindfulness i was and going we- to say yes. is mindful is meditation the tool that gets us to it yeah, one of the form. tools yeah. and one of the forms of meditation Yes, because there are a number of forms of meditation, not all of them are mindfulness meditation. Right. So some forms of meditation take us away from the present moment. Right. M- mindfulness meditation will use an anchor that is here now. Um, so mindfulness meditation is designed to enable us to come into relationship with this moment in a non-reactive, caring manner. Right. Um, so it's not about going off to some other place that's Trans- transcendental. Trancing out. Yeah. Astral planning. Exactly. And and there's nothing wrong with that approach to meditation. Um, and I do a number of practices that are not mindfulness practices in meditation, um, but there are some sort of technical dis- distinctions. Hmm. So mindfulness again, meditation. Med- meditation, like mindfulness, is, is very in vogue. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of meditation this, meditation that. Yeah. And, and I, and it just seems like there's there's so many different techniques. Yeah. Yet sometimes, how different is it to just sitting on a chair and being present with yourself with your eyes closed? Yeah. Yeah. If you're sitting on a chair with your eyes closed, being present with yourself, aware of what's going on, that fits within the definition of mindfulness meditation. Right. Yep. Um, so there's formal practice with mindfulness meditation and then there's informal practice where we bring – awareness, presence to what we're doing. Um, And that for me uh, is just as important as the formal practice. So the informal practice where we make a decision and in the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, people are invited, okay, choose an activity that you do every day and just every day make a decision as you are about to do it to be there. So if it's, you know, Something as mundane as brushing your teeth mm. or rather than your shirt or ironing your shirt. Yeah, let's do ironing your shirt. So ironing your shirt, you can be ironing your shirt and thinking about what you saw on TV last night or you can be ironing your shirt and feeling the, the weight of the iron in the hand, um, feeling, you know, smoothing, feeling the touch of the hand on the shirt as you smooth it, um, observing the angles, being present to the experience or you can be caught up in thought about something else. And so in the practice of mindfulness we move our attention away from the thought stream and into the actual experience that we're having right now Um, and so much of our life we don't live in that way and to be able to notice when we are caught in thought and let that go let the thought go and come back to here um, has been shown to have a great psychological benefit Um, the the part of the the human brain that is activated when we're in mind wandering, uh, which is known as the default mode network, a series of regions of the brain in the midline, that's more highly active in people with high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, OCD. So being able to at will more or less move out of mind wandering and into the present moment has a huge benefit in terms of well-being, psychological well-being. Um, and I think we know that when we think of some of the 
unhelpful mind states that we get caught in mm. um, and and how that makes us feel and how that makes us behave and to be able to stand back from that and say, oh, okay, I'm just not going to put all my attention there. I'm going to choose to put my attention on something that's real here now Yes, um, is a really skillful capacity for our mental health. Because mm. I've heard it said there is only now. Yeah. There is only the present. Yeah. That the past is whatever it was and the future will be whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess from we can talk about the health benefits and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but I just sometimes peel it back and think, well, if I'm not present, then I'm actually missing out on life. Mm. If I spend, mm. if I only spent 30% of my life mm. being present, mm. waking life, mm. then that's 70% wasted. Mm. What have I actually done, achieved, enjoyed? Yeah. If I take myself to my last day on this mortal coil, yeah. what was I doing in that 70%? Yeah. yeah. One of the um, practices that we do in the Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Program in week two, so one of the home practices is to each day pay particular attention to a pleasant event. And they they record it. How did they experience in their body? How did they? What were their thoughts at the time? What were their feelings at the time? And then we come back and we unpack that and one of the revelations that i hear week after or course after course after course in week three is it was so simple it was so the 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 small things that increased my happiness was were always there i just was looking at them differently and so by by being asked in the program to pay attention to pleasant events People become more aware of so much more that's happening. And I walk outside and the sun's on my shoulders. Oh, that's a moment of, of pleasure. Unless I'm caught in my head thinking about, oh, what am I going to do when I get there? If I'm actually present, if I feel the sun on my shoulders, ah, if I'm there reading, and this is like a particular person who did the program, you know, I'm seeing her now. She said, you know, I used to read to my um, daughter in bed at night, reading the words, but not there. And her relationship with her daughter significantly changed because of her being present as she did that. You know, we can we can be with somebody and not be there. And we know that when the person we're with isn't there. Yes. And how dissatisfying that is. Yes. Um, so, so being able to be present is good for us and it's good for the people that we're with. Exactly. Yeah. So um, out of the courses that you run, what are you sort of seeing in the people that come to you? What, what, is, what are some of the reasons? Obviously, you know, we talked about it. You're not out there actively selling, but you're yep. putting your signal out yep. there that this is what I do and this is what I offer. And obviously yep. people are coming to you. Yep. What, what do you sort of see? Why are people, why are people drawn to it? Um, a wide variety of reasons and i think it 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 strikes people at some point in their life that there's got to be a better way of doing it than the way that we're doing it whatever that is and it might be that you don't become aware of that until you've had your you know second or third relapse into clinical depression or it might be that you have this sense of Mm. I've I've done all the things I'm I've been told to do. I've gone out, got the marriage, got the kid, got the job, got the car, and there's some sense of this this pursuit of all this stuff hasn't actually resulted in a, an underlying happiness. Or people come with chronic pain. People come after relationship issues people come basically for also you know well-being um yes how do i it's like an inoculation i see it how do i support myself mm. in this crazy world that we live in where we've got um technology keeping us so highly um overstimulated all mm. the time um where we've got an intensification of pressure in work in life how do i manage this uh you know, we are quite simple beings at one level whose biology evolved in a very different time and place trying to manage 
this quite intense world that we live in. Yes. So how do I do it? I've been doing my best and uh, I find cracks. Can I do it better? Can I, yeah. can I, can I be more um, content at peace and engaged, alive, both of those things? Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess um, it's interesting you mentioned stress because stress just seems to be a, mm. a common word in the everyday mm. vernacular. Mm. And by having it as a common word in the everyday vernacular it's almost legitimizing being yeah. stressed and oh i'm stressed so oh, that's okay that's the thing to yeah. be able to do i mean um when i did uh my master's degree in business psychology um we had a, a professor carrie cooper who was quite preeminent in workplace stress and he described it as uh almost like a seesaw and on one side you've got your perceived pressure of the tasks ahead and on the other side, it, it's your perceived capability to deal mm, with that. Mm. And when one sort of tips over the mm. other, um, you either can get burnout when the mm. when the demand is is too much, your perceived demand uh, is too much. But similarly, when on the other end of the scale is when the demand's not there and you feel that you're highly capable, you can end up with rust out, mm, mm, which a lot of people, mm, I think, get it in work mm. sometimes that they do the same thing over and yeah. over again. yeah. So there we go. Interesting. And and interesting that you use the word perceived as well. Yes. Um, and I think that that capacity to know how we perceive the world is our perception, that awareness is so useful. And most people don't. Most people have no idea that they're – experience is the result of their perception in a large part um they think it's just how it is yes uh so to be able to notice okay i'm experiencing in this way i'm thinking of it in this way and that's because of a whole heap of experiences in my life my conditioning my filters that filter it yes. it's not the truth yes it, it's my um my perception and that helps us get a bit of a better angle on our experience as well yeah i think one of the most interesting things that was put forward to me once was the universe is inherently meaningless it's us that applies meaning mm. to it mm. and how we perceive mm. it and their filters mm. uh, and whatnot mm. so um do you think that there must be do you think there's potentially uh, a link in the the rise of focus on things like meditation and mindfulness as an almost like juxtaposition to We've got the the rise of mobile phones and apps and these yeah. things that are constantly present, demanding our attention. And um, I had a previous guest on the show who, who was telling us that you know a lot of apps are based on keeping us in an anxious state, yeah. fearful state yeah. that makes us want to go back and check yeah. in with it. And we yeah. always get this present shock that yeah. you know, oh, if I haven't looked at my Twitter feed for like uh, an hour and a half, then the whole world has moved on without yeah. me. As a, this, so as that gets increased. Mm. Do you believe there's something in there, like the almost like the, the the greater total self is going? Oh, if we're going to amp up on this side, then we've got to yeah. we've got to do something on the other side to balance this out. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the human organism needs downtime. We need rest. We need um, experiences where we're not constantly being stimulated. And as you say, you know, the fellow who talked about the apps keep us addicted. You know, yes. The same part of the brain is lighting up just before we press on the Facebook icon as get as lights up in the cocaine crack addict. Yes. Um, and I think we know that when we try and take a break from, um, you know, the social media for a bit. Have a low media diet. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think you're right. I think there are two reasons, two key reasons why mindfulness has become um, so sought after and so popular. And one of them is the the increasing um, constant turned onness through technology and, and high increasing pressure in life. Um, people are expecting to do more um, both in work and in play time. So I think that's one of the elements. And the other element is the research. I think that if, it, if there was no research from uh, very well-respected scientific establishments showing that this actually had a benefit, mm. 
I don't think it would have taken on in the way that it has. So I think it's it's both of those conditions coming together at the same time, which means people are saying, I need to do something differently to, to manage this life. Oh, look at that. The research is saying that I'll be able to do my self-resourcing through mindfulness um, and be able to engage with life in a way that's less reactive, um, engage with the things that come my way um, in a more more thoughtful, reflective, uh, from a more thoughtful and reflective um, position. Mm. It's interesting yeah. that, um, as, I, as I listen to you talk there, it's interesting that we should need almost research to convince us that mm. it's a good thing mm. when... Mm. You know, when we t- when we do take a step mm. out mm. from our everyday life and say, you know, you go on holiday to mm. a different place, you sit by the pool and not do so much, or you go for a travel and you sit on the bus and just look yeah. out a window, or do something like that, and and the the the, the routines and the patterns and and the busyness that I think I believe that we we're often addicted to busyness. Yeah. Um, when they slip to one side, then this fantastic, relaxed, resourceful, mm. Mm. creative state comes out and, yeah. and people can come back. I, I've had a friend recently that's come back from two weeks on Rotnest uh, and he's just said, you know, it's the first time in ages I sat back and chilled mm. out and all these great ideas and mm. thoughts started to come out. Mm. So it's interesting mm. that we should need research, scientific mm. research mm. to convince us yeah. that this is a good thing. Well, we get so many messages that are different that are the opposite from just pause, Mm. sit still for a bit, don't run around. We don't get those kinds of messages. We get messages that are about achieving, striving, getting more, being more. And, and of course, that's, that's a, that's an exciting part of life. We respond to that. Um, Part of our biology is to go out and seek rewards. And so we have so many messages through advertising and other forms of, um, uh, social um, conversation that say do more. They don't say be more. We don't get many messages that say there's, there's a real value in pausing. There's a real value in in thinking about how you are in the world, thinking how you are with others. Um, it, it's, quite, it's, it's quite interesting, I think, that mindfulness has enabled us to recapture conversations around um, ways of being, how you are in the world, Uh, dare I say, you know, values and virtues and character and things like that, um, that in a world that's got faster and faster, more about consumption, less about relationships, those kinds of conversations have dropped quite dramatically. I'm hoping that this is a space um, that enables us to have more of those conversations about what actually makes human beings happy. Yes. It's about relationships. It's about um, being in a group, belonging, uh, having meaning in life. You know, the bling, the research shows that the bling doesn't make us happy. Um, it might for a moment. And, you know, it's fun and all of that kind of thing. But if you're, if you're thinking about um, ongoing quality of life, the bling doesn't count for very much Mm. yeah that's interesting that i think um and certainly listen to what you're saying i think there's there's a lot about a lot of pressure on us like you say to do more and we're we're constantly so there's a lot of things around which encourage us to stay in that um problem solving Uh, active state of mind uh, you know work is continually uh, problem solving yeah and it's that uh, that um the alpha state of brain waves you know Everywhere we go now, people are going for coffee, um, mm. you know, and that helps to keep mm. the brain active mm. and alert mm. and problem solving. Mm. Yet the, these other states in sort of like beta state brainwaves mm. and theta state brainwaves where we can start to access our intuition and more of our resources mm. and realize that there is more within us. Mm. I certainly mm. in a few other podcasts, we've got to the conclusion that um, we should almost re rebadge the world of um self-development to self-revealment because mm. it's all within you mm. and by ha- by meditating mm. and being more mindful we can mm. access these mm. resources mm. It's, a, it's fast, fascinating you talking about problem solving one of the things um that the the current form of mindfulness 
um, differentiates is between the doing mode and the being mode. Yeah. I and like and the doing mode is important, um, but often the doing mode is all that we experience. You know, the striving, the goal, the problem solving, da 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 da, and one of the problems that arises is that we can turn that doing mode on ourselves when we become the problem. And so we can then... um, How do you mean by we become the problem? So why am I feeling this way? I should be happy. I'm waking up and I'm... And so we turn our problem-solving mind on ourselves Ah. and that, in fact, is a recipe for disaster. We, We check in with where we're at and we know where we want to be and all we look at is the gap. And so we focus on the gap and that keeps us in a, a an unhelpful downward spiral potentially. And so the alternative of actually moving from that doing problem-solving mode when it's about ourselves and just saying, okay, how about this being mode where I'm present, where I know what's going on, where I'm in touch where my senses are open, where I'm experiencing in this moment fully. Yeah, and I'm happy to sit with comfort and discomfort yep. alike. Yep, yep, um, building in that that capacity to move with whatever's coming my way. Um, is a useful component, a vital component um, for some of the uh, conditions such as anxiety and depression those are characterised by the doing mode, the problem-solving mode turned in on itself. Um, and so to be able to have access to a being mode uh, is is very useful. Mm. I suppose it's giving yourself that permission to have some being time mm. and then mm. doing that actively. I mean, is being sitting and watching a film? No. So what is being? <laughs> So, um, and I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with sitting and watching a film. Um, And and we can can sit and watch a film and be aware that we're sitting and watching a film. But usually we just get caught up in the the buzz of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so, So being is having an awareness of what it is that we're doing. Um. Then I've, I've slipped in doing that. Awareness of what's happening in this moment. So if I'm walking down to the bus stop, I'm walking down to the bus stop. I can feel my feet on the um, pavement. I can feel the wind in my hair. I can feel the um, bag over my shoulder. I can hear the sounds. I'm 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 connected with my experience. Mm, my phone's in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have a mobile phone. No, um, no. So that's one of my little structures for minimizing that distractedness through technology um yeah so my phone isn't um but it's not to say I don't spend too much time on my computer connected to social media and things like that um you know it's just one way of minimizing it in my life and when I'm sitting down and having dinner with my partner I'm sitting down and having dinner with my partner um I'm present to that when I'm having a difficult conversation with a colleague, hmm, I'm opening up to that. I'm aware of what's going on. I'm present to the emotions bubbling away, the insecurity, whatever's here. And I'm also experiencing it from the perspective of the other, what's, what's happening as well. So uh, one of the things that mindfulness enables us to do is broaden our perspective. When we're in a stressed situation, our perspective narrows just down onto I, me, mine, what I need to do to survive in this situation. And in that type of situation, we're more likely to have conflict. When we are able to to pause and take a bigger perspective, we can actually think, oh, so what's happening for Bryn at the moment? Hmm. Oh, I remember that he said something about, you know, his mum, da-da-da, or whatever, and then remember that, oh, there's stuff going on for him as well. Um and that enables us to engage with each other in a way that's more supportive of everybody. Mm. Um, that broadening of perspective, really useful. How do you see um, sort of mindfulness and mindfulness levels within 
Western Australia and how have you seen it change? Because you were born here. Yeah. And you've lived in, in, in the different places that I mentioned that's yeah. like Wind and Bass. Yeah. Um how have you seen like sort of almost residual levels of mindfulness mm. change and alter in Western Australia? Mm. I've never thought about that. And it makes me um, th- think about the fact that all of us in certain circumstances are mindful in certain circumstances are not. Um, we talked earlier about the measures of mindfulness. So they talk about trait mindfulness and state mindfulness. Right. Uh, and so, you know, if everybody in Western Australia right now was given one of these um, questionnaires, they'd come up with a number about how mindful they are or aren't um, as a as their way of being. So if we're thinking about it in that way and over time has that changed, um, you know, I have a sense that technology has made us much more mindless rather than mindful. Um, I have a sense that when we try and stuff so much into our lives, uh it means that we are constantly in that doing mode rather than um, present to the experience. I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing in 10 minutes' time when I'm with that person. So we've got so much so that the mind is constantly preparing itself for what next. And and that's really hard to be present when you've got lots and lots of things that you're trying to do. Mm. Um, I think with the increase of activity um, comes an increase in mindlessness and also um, living uh, higher levels of anxiety um, because we're not coming down and resting. We're not coming down and, and pausing. And that will have longer-term health issues. Oh, absolutely. If we're firing off the stress response yeah. and anxiety response. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting question that one um and it just sort of off the cuff i think that's probably how i see it yes so it's yeah we become increasing so it's almost like we're creating a, a, a sort of armies of almost zombies because they're just being a go do go do go yeah, do yeah interesting and as as you say that you know i'm uh, what popped up in my head was you know the um Romans, you know, give them bread and circuses. Yes. Give them apps and, um, you know, technology, mobile phones, and that will keep them so preoccupied uh, that they can be manipulated. So much more easy to manipulate people who are constantly doing and not pausing and noticing what's going on and having time for a reflection. Um, yes. Hmm. Yes, because I suppose with you know with apps and things you can keep people in a state of mm. anxiety mm. And, and what have you, and you can be sending them messages through media and what have you, and they'll be more susceptible to it and mm. more amenable. Mm. It almost sounds conspiratorial. I'm not suggesting it's conspiratorial. <laughs> no, no. Um, but it means that we are less likely to be able to respond to the conditions of our life because we we don't have that capacity. It's being chewed up in the, the stuff, mm. the bling. What would you think would happen if we, um, so you, you mentioned earlier on that there's a, there's a scale for mindfulness trait and yeah. state. So I take it that the trait is that, that sort of capacity to be mindful yeah. and then the state is how often you access that. In this moment. What do you think would happen to Western Australia if we just upped it a little, upped it one point or maybe two points? It's a very exciting thought. Um, I have a sense that much of our um, doing and our consumption and our uh, unhelpful reactivity would lessen. Um, because we would be finding meaning and happiness in things that are more substantial. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think that our capacity to listen to the planet would change. I think our capacity to 
listen to each other would improve. Um, I think it would be quite a remarkable mm. uh, positive move. Yeah. yeah. E- even as I posed that question and I was listening to what you were saying, I suddenly thought, oh, what would happen if I got asked that question? Yeah. And, and strangely, I think um, as a healthy byproduct, I imagine things like productivity and what had you would increase mm. Um, mm. but not at the mm. expense of mm. impacts on healthcare through uh, you know, chronic depression or yeah. chronic backache or things yeah. that are associated yeah. with stress so we'd probably become more productive yeah and then incidentally be- incidentally yeah. and become less of a burden yeah on the infrastructure yeah. but as a happy byproduct yeah indeed the um there's research from Aetna, which is a big insurance company in the US, do health insurance amongst other things. Mm. 50,000 workforce, a quarter of their workforce have gone through um, a mindfulness program. So they've seen it as a big um, of value to them as an organisation. They calculate that, uh, and this wasn't how they... Um, <coughs> promoted it, I don't think, but they have calculated decreases in stress, decreases in um, sleep problems, you know, so positive health benefits for the staff and 62 minutes a week of increased productivity, which per staff member is about $3,000 at the time they did that research. Hmm. Um, And they didn't do it ostensibly for that benefit, but that's one of the benefits that came out. Yeah, yeah. So yes, that's pretty. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting oh. avenue to go down. Mm. Indeed, mm. indeed. Um, so, for you personally, what does I say? You know, what are your sort of goals over the forthcoming years with mind and movement, and for yourself? You know, what does a, a happy, productive, successful, whatever, whatever mm. adjective you want to look at, life look like for you as we look forward mm. over the next mm. you know, three, five years? Um, so it's been, you know, quite a bit of work for me to move into this space and move into running a business, which is not something, um, I have, uh, a, an inclination to do. Yes. So, you know, learning marketing, learning, running a Facebook page, learning mm. all these things has been an investment of time and energy. Yes. Um, I can imagine, sorry to burn in, uh, I can imagine going through the process of, of learning how to market Facebook and this, that, and the other. It helps you to refine what mindfulness actually means for you because it forces you to ask those questions. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, one of the people who came and did the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program with me was uh, a, a marketer and he's said to me, oh, why don't we come, you know, get together and talk about this so I can help you actually refine a little bit better yeah. how you talk about it because he loved it. He loved the program. Brilliant. It was fantastic. Um, so that's still an area of, uh, of development for me. Um, I would like to do this, the same programs that I'm running, continue doing those. I love them. I find it so exciting to get to the end of a eight week program and hear people's responses to what they have learned and experienced. Mm. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So I'd like to keep on doing How's all of that. Feel? Oh, fantastic. I love week eight of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. Uh, uh, you know, as I say, that one woman from the last program just pops into my head um, and she said that so each person I invite them just to say something that they've noticed uh, that's changed over the time. And she said, you know, in the last week her husband had said something to her which was offensive. And normally she said I would have jumped up, rah, reacted. This time I asked him what did he mean? And he explained what he meant, which was completely different to what I had understood. And so just her different way. And she said, my children and my husband are saying, where's mum gone? Right. So she's calm. She's relaxed. She's engaging with them completely different. Um, and she's loving it. You know, she's saying, she, I could never have used the word calm for the last 20 years of my life. I'm now feeling calm. Wow. That's so good to be with somebody who's able to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make a positive impact. Yeah. Um, so for me, continue doing the programs that I run, 
but for it to take less hours per day per week. So that's my goal, to have um, more space in my life mm. uh, and to be doing the same amount of work. And I think that's feasible. I think in the getting up of a, a new enterprise, it takes a lot of effort. So I'm hoping to be able to continue working at the rate that I'm working in terms of um, the number of programs that I run and things like that, but it actually taking less of my time. So I don't right. want to do more. I want to do the same, and it, I'm hoping that that will be less hours per week. Just focus on and that. And so I can do more practice myself. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. What's, um, what, what, what's one thing people would be surprised to know about Catherine, having listened to this? <laughs> all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Um, the first thing that jumped into my mind, so I'll go with that, um, was that in hmm, 1982 I was in the Army Reserves. Wow. What drew you to that? I was a um, flute player and I was at uni and... Uh, they would pay me to play the flute in the Army Reserve Band. Wow. So I didn't want to be a soldier. No, you but to the flute. <laughs> I wanted to play the flute and they would pay me to do it. So I would go along every Tuesday night and do rehearsals and we would do gigs, you know, marching along in my Army uniform, playing the flute with yeah. the Army Band. Yeah. Awesome. Hmm. And if you could go back to um, meet that, Catherine, just before your mum took you to that first yeah. meditation evening or um, session yeah. and give her a bit of advice, yeah. what would that be? This is going to be really important to you. S- give it a... Um, don't wait another 10 years to really integrate it into your life. Um, you know, embrace it. Yeah. Mm. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So if somebody's listened to all this and they're thinking, oh, how, how can I start doing this? What, mm. what's some of the first steps mm. that they can be taking? Yeah. Um, there are some terrific resources online. I would really strongly recommend people have a look at where they come from and what's underpinning them. Um, there are a number of universities now that have online materials. Uh, I would choose something that does have the backing of um, a university if you don't know, if you don't know. There are a number of organisations um Outside universities are doing fantastic things as well. But there's also a lot of mishmash that has been put together now under mindfulness because mindfulness is such a buzzword um, that are are not, in fact, mindfulness. So if you actually want to be doing mindfulness, you know, do your research, find out where it's coming from. Find It can be really helpful to join a group. Um, I personally sit with a group every Tuesday night as well as part of my support as well as doing the teaching I'm doing. Um, it can be a hard thing to do just by yourself mm. and to sustain it. So find some buddies, find some friends. Um, if apps are something that works for you, use apps, um, but find out where they're from. Be and discerning. don't, Yeah, and also don't expect a quick fix. Mm. Um, it's not a quick fix. I've been doing this now for over 25 years and – it's still an ongoing process for me. Um, it, Like exercise, it takes some effort, it takes some commitment, it takes some dedication to actually be able to see the results. So don't be surprised after a week that it hasn't solved all your problems. It won't. Mm. Um, it, it, it's an ongoing, slow process and it is really worthwhile. It's... It's lovely to be able to experience life in a different way. Um, that you've actively chosen. I yeah, suppose. absolutely. Superb. And if people wanted to come and find you, having listened to this, how yep. do they find you? Uh, so Mind and Movement um, is probably the best place to have a look at, my website um, and my phone number, 9468-9680. <laughs> 
This is not um, a mobile number. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it'd be lovely. And I'm, I'm always open to have conversations with people whether or not they are interested in doing anything with me um, in, in the end. I, I think this is such an interesting way of supporting people to live lives that are more fulfilling for them and that they, they become better contributors to society through this. So I'm, I'm up for any conversation around it. Awesome. Love it. Awesome. Catherine, it's been super talking to you today. It's great to actually have a space where we can have a proper conversation about mm. some of the things which I think everybody deep down knows is, is not quite right and mm. how do I go about it and 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 there's more to life than this and mm. what are some of the tools and um, I seem to be here, there and everywhere. And I think it's great to actually have an open and honest conversation about this. What are the impact of you know, mobile phones and 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 making slightly less mindful decisions. Mm. So I've really, really appreciated being able to unpick what mindfulness is, what meditation is, mm. how to move forwards it. Mm. And it's been awesome. So thank you very much. My pleasure. It's been and lovely for me too. Excellent, excellent. And I would like to thank the listeners out there that have um, spent the time to listen to this. I, I feel absolutely sure that you'll have got tons out of this. And um, yes, I thank you again for listening in. So... Thank you. Take care.